Good evening, everybody. It's February 24th. This is John Jay. Thanks for joining. We're going to talk about how to change the, um, the cash flow, how it's documented with a 1099, okay, for merchant accounts, businesses, independent contractor type situations. Um, someone was mentioning this to me the other day, and it would be, uh, it seemed like a, a pretty good topic to cover. Uh, it's a common question. And I'll just share some uh, details that we can cover it. We can talk about it. And then also, I wanted to mention, someone was uh, mentioning to me the other day, I wanted to cover this, where you're not getting a 1099 at the exchanges, but you're getting some kind of other report. And I wanted to talk about that. So let me just start with the other one first. Um, so um, what we're talking about is uh, when you have a 1099 situation, let's say you got a contract somewhere or a merchant account and you're the guarantor and you're the account holder, there's a distinction there, two things going on, and you give your SSN and your name and all this sort of thing, and you get a 1099, and uh, that's how the money is reported, and then it does get reported to your business master file or your individual master file with the IRS. Now, if you want to check and see what's being reported, you can always use form 4506-T. This is an IRS form. It has an OMB number at the top right corner. It's an official government form. And it is a 4506-T transcript request. And if you, if you read that form, it's almost self-explanatory. I mean, you can just check the box as to what you want. What you typically are going to want are all third-party pay or reports, 1099s, whatever they are, 1099-B, miscellaneous, whatever. Um, you want to see all W-2s, you know, all these things to make sure that you know what the IRS knows about your income, who's, being rep who's reporting income on you. So that's, uh, you pull the transcripts, you can select, I think they let you, they have you do one form for every three years. So you can go back three years and then the other three years be, before that. And you can ask for records from your individual master file. And I would also recommend that you include records from your business master file, okay? Individual master file, IMF, business master file, BMF. Okay, so you can then see what the IRS sees regarding your income. So if you wanna change something, Let's say you're running a business and uh, maybe someone paying your business, it's a sole proprietorship, let's say, and they're gonna pay you uh, and they're gonna give you a 1099. Or you have a merchant account and you're, all, you're the account holder and you're the guarantor in the account and you're gonna get that 1099. Or you have a stock trading account, right? You're, you're getting stock and when you get dividends, you get a 1099 statement at the end of the year or whatever. If you wanna change that, remember, if you document the, transaction a certain way, you can avoid certain liabilities. So let's talk about taxes. If you want to avoid a tax liability here, you switch over the 1099 from yourself individually to a company and a pass-through. That's the same thing we use for crypto investing. So if I have an LLC account at Coinbase and I'm getting a it's getting a 1099, I can just ignore it. If I have a merchant processor and it's collecting sales that I have, a let's say I have an online uh, business and it's selling things, and I'm gonna get uh, so much money per quarter or per year or whatever, mm -hmm. my merchant account is going to send a 1099 in the name of the account holder, not the guarantor, the account holder. So if my company is the account holder with the merchant processor, it's gonna get the 1099 and, and I can choose to, what I want to do with that. And it can be a taxable or it doesn't have to be, okay? If I'm the account holder, I'm going to get the 1099. I don't have a choice. It's going to have to show up on my 1040. If it doesn't show up on my 1040, I better have a good reason or I better get the IRS to agree that it shouldn't be there. It should be excluded, right? But to avoid all that drama, you would use you would use a limited liability company as a pass-through and switch the 1099 over there. Now, here's how you do it. Here's a very simple way. Let me give an example. So if I have a merchant account, what I would do is tell the merchant processor, I just call them up on the phone and say, hey, I, I need to change over the account holder because I just did a reorganization or my accountant said I have to use an LLC now, uh, where before it's maybe a sole proprietorship, right, or individually. So they, they a lot of times these merchant processors, they understand that that happens as a, as a practice. So what will happen is uh, you you can provide a, just like opening a bank account for your LLC, the processor is going to want to see the uh, registered articles of your LLC, you know, the stamp version. And it's basically, if you want to use the same documents that I provide for the banking abstract, that should be enough. A merchant processor is probably going to not need to do a lot of investigation like a bank would, um, even though it's really a banking function. So you're going to need a copy of the articles of the LLC. You're going to need a, it's a EIN approval letter. 
And, to, and for added measure to make it work, you want to provide the company that's paying the money in that 1099, you want to give it a W-9, okay? Now, in my README First file, when I complete your documents and send you everything, in the README First, there is a, a, a screenshot of a W-9. And on there, I'm showing you uh, the first box is going to be the name of the LLC. The second box you're going to skip. Then you're going to put, you're going to select, um, I think it's um, an LLC designation and then P for partnership on that third line, if I remember correctly. And then the address that you've, you've chosen, you can use the address that's on your EIN approval letter, that, that helps. And then sign for the company. Now there's a spot for the EIN. Put the EIN of the company there. Do not put your SSN anywhere and sign as vice president or sign as manager or authorized signatory. So when you switch over a merchant account so that you're not gonna get the 1099 anymore, you want it to go to your LLC. You're gonna give the merchant processor whatever it asks for really, but it's gonna ask you for a copy of the articles that are stamped by the state. The, you can give them the unofficial copy, the articles. Um, it may want so like a uh, bank resolution, you know, showing your authority. It may want um, a certificate of beneficial interest. I don't think it wants that, but it may. It's almost the same documents that you would use at a bank account, okay? You're also gonna wanna give the EIN approval letter to show this valid EIN and to make, to, for added measure, you wanna make sure that you give a W-9. And a W-9, you can just download off the internet. I think the mo most recent version is from 2018. And then you would just fill it out like I was just describing, okay? That's how you switch it over. Now, um, let me check here. Okay, let's see. Yeah. All right. Now, um, if it's a stock trading account, same process, but a little bit different in the sense that you're not always talking to people that know what they're doing. And so you want to make sure that the person who's going to transfer or convey your stock holdings at, you know, let's say Charles Schwab, for example, you're going to uh, convey your stock holdings from your personal name to an LLC name. So you need to open a new account at that brokerage in the name of the LLC. And then you want to convey the title of the stock from your name to the LLC. Now, here's the very important part. The conveyance, of course, is not a sale. You can, you can tell them it's for estate planning. You just want it retitled. It's retitled. The beneficial interests are going to remain the same. So the conversation you want to have is with someone who appears to understand what you're talking about. So you have to explain. When you retitle, or when you move these these uh, stock uh, portfolios, when you move these stock holdings over to the LLC account, do not show it as a sale. There should be no 1099. There cannot be a 1099. Make sure that they understand that it's just simply being retitled or reorganized for estate planning purposes. And sometimes you may have to talk to a manager or someone who's a bit older that may understand. That some, maybe the younger people may not understand what you're talking about. By all means, make sure that it's a conveyance for estate planning purposes and there's no sale, okay? If there is a sale and they make a mistake, so far I haven't had that happen. We're very careful. Um, you might be able to get it corrected. I've never been in that situation. So uh, I would just suggest trying to avoid that situation. Same thing with payors. Let's say you're a professional service and you're getting 1099s uh, from other businesses. Let's say it's business to business or professional to business, right? Um, you, you may just have to do that same process with each payor. So you would give the payor, a lot of times you could just, you could just call them up and say, Hey, I have a new company and I ha it has a new tax number. And they might say, Oh uh, yeah, send it over. Let me, let us see a copy of the uh, EIN approval letter. Um, what's the name of the company and is the address the same things like that? It might be pretty simple. Um, just to be sure I would almost <clears throat> in every case I would give the payor a, a W-9, okay? The purpose of the W-9 is to establish the correctness of the EIN, okay? Mm -hmm. And it also shifts the liability. Remember, this is all about managing liability. So if someone makes a mistake, make sure you're not liable for it. And they're not likely gonna make a mistake if you give them a W-9, okay? So anyways, that is a brief rundown. If you guys have any questions on that, if you would, please, let's stay focused on that unless we, we don't have any more of those questions. Um, the only other thing I want to mention is kind of a second issue here, a second subject I want to cover, just because I think this fits in, is on the exchanges. Remember, a lot of, a lot of the things you're hearing 
about cryptos and tax reporting is just to get you to do a certain thing. Okay. It's not accurately telling you what you have to do. Okay. But if you do it, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just a lot of times you'll pay a lot more taxes. So one, one of the things I just discovered the other day is Coinbase is sending out this thing called a, um, it's called a uh, gain loss report. So the question you would ask is, oh my gosh, gain loss report. I have gains according to Coinbase. Do I need to report them on my 1040? This is the purpose of that document. In my opinion, they want you to, to trick you into doing this, okay? This is vastly different than a 1099. Here's how you know. If you look at the 1099, the top right corner, you're gonna see the OMB number. Typically it'll be like OMB 1545, dash some four digit number, okay? OMB stands for Office of Management and Budget. That's a federal government agency that has to do with OMB document, official documents, okay? That is an official government form, a 1099. That tells you that that document and that information on there was also given to the IRS in this case. If you get a gain loss report from Coinbase, um, it is their software, Coinbase's software, and it's, suggesting that you should file a return. And a lot of times what it's doing is causing people who did not get a 1099 to go to their accountant who will then say, oh yeah, we have to report the gains the way it says here on the document. I'm just gonna recommend that you not do that. There's no reason to pay tax on something for which you did not actually receive a gain on under a cash basis uh, reporting, okay? So just be aware of that. On the gain loss report from Coinbase or any of the other exchanges, I think they're all gonna start doing this. Look in the top right corner, you will see there's no OMB number. This is not an official form, okay? And you can also, if you're not sure, you can do a second verification, get a copy of your transcripts from the IRS. You ask for your individual master file on form 4506-T, all right? So if we could, Let's uh, open up for questions. You guys are welcome to send me something in the chat, but you can also just raise your hand and I will, I will call on you. I wanna to try to stay focused on that. If that's too simple and we covered everything, we can certainly uh, talk about other things. Um, if that's the case, we're not gonna to go too much longer. All right, good. I'm glad that sounds pretty simple. All right. Uh, just so you know, I am, I've got lots more content coming. Um, I, this call becomes content a lot of times on the ultimate section of my video membership. Uh, sometimes I, I put parts of it on YouTube. There is more content in what I set up just recently, with, which is the inner circle uh, on uh, privacyfight.io. That'll be an a la carte type video. Um, we have content now on the request for determination letter. I went and published the whole letter. It's all up there. You guys can't see it yet. So don't get frustrated. I deliberately haven't published it. It's not available yet, but the content's available. I just haven't published it. Um, we have more uh, explanation on the operating agreement that you guys get. Uh, the standard operating agreement that I like to use, I go through all the different provisions of the operating agreement explaining why I have it written that way, why I omit some things, why I've removed certain things from the operating agreement. That's gonna be part one. Now I have part two that's gonna talk about how to bring on an equity partner. And I'm gonna show you how to modify the operating agreement for that purpose. And then among other things, uh, there's a couple more things I wanna show you on how to add certain provisions and why and when on the operating agreement. So I'm thinking it's gonna be more like a three, maybe a four part video series on the operating agreement, its purpose and how you guys can use it. All right, so there's a lot more too. I do wanna do a couple, maybe it's gonna be at least one or two with each of those video series. I'm going to have a Q and A session. It's gonna be live. We can talk about these things. And then um, uh, I'm gonna talk about Jay's trust. I know he did a great job, really guys. He did a great job explaining how to use them, but I know y'all still have questions. I have my way to explain an application for the use of Jay's trust. Okay, he was speaking generically. I can give you more specifics. So I'm gonna do you know, probably one or two uh, video segments on, on using his trust. I see here, there's some questions. So let me get to those real quick. Um, I see someone's guys. Okay, Rich, I'll get to you in just a second. Um, can the e equity be stripped from a single member LLC? A trust is the single member that owns a home. Okay, and has notice of tax lien. Okay, so if the if the lien, the lien is on the title holder. Okay, so if the lien the lien person on the notice from the IRS, I'm assuming it's a it's a person, a human being. Okay. If that person is not on the title at the time that the notice of lien is published, it won't attach to the property. So 
stripping the equity, you can't do that with the IRS. Um, in order to, to avoid the IRS lien and uh, encumbering the property, you actually have to deed the title to a third party. It has to be an innocent party. So if John Smith had a problem with the IRS and he had some liens coming and maybe he sees them coming in this before the liens get filed, the notices of lien, he can convey the title to a company or a trust or something. I don't care who owns the LLC, that doesn't matter. It's just the title of the LLC. It could be a single member LLC, no problem for this purpose. Um, and if he does that before the notice of lien is published, it will not attach to the property, okay? But there is no other way because an IRS lien has a priority over a mortgage. So the way you strip equity is with a mortgage. So it wouldn't matter the IRS still has a priority lien. Ironically, a state tax lien has a priority over the IRS lien. Not to say that it's easy to use it that way, but just so you know. All right. And then if I'm working as an independent contractor, I would follow the instructions you just gave. Exactly. Independent contractors. You would use a W-9 maybe a phone call. A lot of times you can, you know, contact personnel, payroll, those guys handle it. If, even if they don't ask for a W-9, I give them a W-9. Um, I'm going to get back to the, uh, the next one from, uh, from Jen, but I'm going to go over here. I think, uh, oh, Rich had a question. Um, Rich? Hi, John. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I hope this is a simple question. Um, you had discussed um, conveying investment accounts over to the LLC. Um, would you recommend doing that with, um, the crypto trust that you helped me set up or should that be a separate entity if you have a crypto trust already that's with an sufficient. llc yeah okay yeah, great that's sufficient. okay it's good like it is yep all right thank you all right all right jen uh what do you got there is it the same question you have in the chat window yes it is okay please ask yeah. about using the llc to set up for me hold title real estate yeah once you have the llc you know, sometimes you can convey title without registering the LLC, but let's just say standard, what we always do, we register it, then we convey the title of the real estate. Just so you know, if that's all you're going to do with it, you don't need an EIN, don't need a bank account. If you sell the real estate in the name of the LLC, you will need a bank account to clear the funds. So that's, that's what I was asking. I thought I had heard in one of your talks though, that there was a way around that to not necessarily need the bank account is, did I misunderstand that? Or do, if what you I have need to clear to funds, uh, it's kind of, kind of difficult to do that through a yeah. title company, you want to make it look like everybody else, right? So, okay. so at the time you would have clear funds, you got to get an EIN and a bank account. That's so, the way. okay, perfect. So if I already have a crypto, an LLC that you set me up that I'm using for crypto and I'm about to, it's a rental property. I do still have a tenant in it, but we're about to list it and anticipate it selling pretty quickly. And I haven't moved it yet. Would it make sense to just move it into the LLC I already have for crypto temporarily? And then that way I don't have to open a new bank account, get a I new would. tax study. Yes, so, I mean, normally because, you wouldn't, yeah. right? Because of the, the liability with a, with a rental. Yeah, but... you're going to have a temporary situation. You're going to hold the title and then it's going to be liquidated and you got cash and you got cryptos. And cryptos are extremely liquid anyways. So your risk is almost nil. It's nothing to do it that way. Even if you even if you held the property there for a while, I just don't recommend that as a practice because real estate is vastly different than cryptos, but cryptos are quite liquid. So you're pretty good there. Okay. That'll be fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And it does shouldn't matter, right? If my LLC is in Virginia and the property is in South Carolina, shouldn't make a difference, right? It's, it's legally permissible to do that, but you're going to run into some friction from the title company because attorneys get involved and they just don't like things like that. They're trained to make you a resident, you know, and, but you can close the deal that way. We've done it many times. And so if I didn't want to do that, I just have to get a new tax ID number, a new bank account. And no, then... no. let's say your, your property is situated in a state where the LLC is not registered, right. but the LLC owns it. Okay. Yeah. If there's some need which so far I've not run into that. But if there were a need, you could just simply take that same LLC and register to that state. You okay. domesticate it. Yeah. Okay. I mean, from what I've looked online, I shouldn't have to do that with South Carolina. You should not but... have to do that. Right. Okay. okay. Perfect. Thank you so okay. much. Sure. Appreciate All it. All right. All right. All right. Let's see. And uh, Demetra. What, what's your question? What, what are you working on? Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Right. Sorry. Right. Um, so, Jen, I just wanted to, to know, um, as working as an independent contractor and wanting to switch over, can I use the LLC we opened up for cryptos, or would I would it be best to have a, a separate LLC for getting paid? I would not mix a crypto investment with regular income from a profession I have. 
Now you can do it and it's low risk. It's just not a good practice. So, you know, maybe if you have to do it urgently, do it and then take your time, you know, before the end of the tax period, like December 31st, square it up to where there's a separate company that's handling that. And then if you do it that way, you're going to make two changes to your 1099. So just be aware of that as well. Okay. So yeah. it's best to just get another LLC up and running for yeah. getting paid. Yeah. Do okay. it right the first time, especially if it's for professional service. It makes sense to do it right the first time. Well, okay. Can you help explain why? Like, why is it not a good practice to okay. have them together? This is, this is a good question because how does John quantify this? Because <laughs> um, I'm thinking without even asking you more questions, I look at a human being, a person like you or me, as a person who can be sued, right? Or who can be accused of something like money laundering or can be arrested for some crazy thing that may result in civil asset forfeiture. All kinds of craziness can happen, right? Why do you wanna mix that in with not just a crypto account? We're not talking about, you know, it's, it's a, my checking account that I pay my bills with. No, no, this is a crypto account. This is an entire portfolio, right? Am I right? So it's a profession. I don't know what the risk factors are. All I know is you're a human being that could be accused of all kinds of nastiness. And now you've got it tied to a portfolio where the owner's the same. That for the long term is not a good idea. Maybe for a three month period shouldn't be a problem. That's just one example. That's why that's how I that's the reason why I tell you you should separate it out. And that's why I also say it's low risk and you can get away with it for a while. You can probably get away with it for 10 years. Right. But if you're going to pay me money and ask me for my advice, that's what I'm going to tell you. Let's do it right. Thanks. Okay. All right. So, okay. So how, uh, okay. The, the, and the mortgage agreement, when you deed your property over to protect it, take it out of your estate, for example, um, the mortgage company has, I'll pull the, I'm going to pull a document all the time. The mortgage company has a, a right to, um, what do you call it? Hey, turn that back on has a right to, um, what do you call it? The, recall the mortgage. It's called a due on sale clause. I think all of them have it, trust deeds. Um, but I'm gonna show you something. Even though the mortgage company has a right to foreclose, it's probably in your contract. It's not gonna exercise it. it and it shouldn't, it should not exercise it. And if it did exercise the right to foreclose because you conveyed the title, you would be able to defeat the foreclosure. It would be a foreclosure because you didn't change the risk for which the bank took. The bank lent money for you to buy the property and you didn't just convey the property to some stranger, you retain the beneficial interest. And that's the key phrase there. I'm trying to find something here that I use for, um, here we go. I don't know, maybe I should probably do a screen share here. Um, in fact, this is in one of my videos. Let me, um, let me see if I can, do a screen share and show you guys. So I will convey the title in some cases when it's it's called for, okay? And um, I won't tell the bank unless I'm already talking to the bank about something. I don't wanna, I don't wanna alert them because what happens is I've, I've talked to people that work at the bank and they'll say, hey, don't bring that up because they're gonna do all kinds of stuff. It's gonna create all these letters. I'm gonna be on phone calls for three days. So the banks themselves even admit that this is kind of bureaucracy. So you don't want to tell the bank that you're going to do this. If they discover it and they ask and they send you a letter and ask you about it, here's what it's going to look like as a response. Let me just do a screen share here. Um, that's a good, really good question. Uh, let's see. There we go. Screen share. Okay. You see. So this is my example letter. See how simple it is? Now, yeah, this is an example of where we did it for a trust, I think. But an LLC is the same thing. Um, I put a legal reference down here. This is what I really want to show you. If you look down here, you'll see, you can look this up online a transfer in which the borrower is and remains benef beneficiary. I didn't say that. You hear me say beneficial interest all the time. And then you say, why are you the only one saying stuff like that? I don't hear this from my accountant. And now I'm showing you, as it turns out, here's a federal law 
that refers to the beneficial interest not changing. Okay, so John didn't make this stuff up. Not, not that it's a problem that you guys don't believe me, but still, it's nice to get validation when you have this. Okay, so I've never had a problem. Now I have to confess, uh, I had a I had a, a duplex one time. Um, this was way back, 20 years ago or something. And I and I knew all this stuff. Okay, back then. And my partner and I had this duplex, and we we put it into a title like like I have you guys do. And Bank of America made a big stink about it. And um, we said, no, we don't want to put it in our names. We're investors and we're managing a risk a certain way. And they went and foreclosed on the property and we made the arguments and we lost. So <laughs> sometimes you can be completely right. Uh, you know, um, and ironically, in 30 years of doing this, I'm the only one that suffered that. None of my clients have, as far as I know. So <laughs> just be aware of it. Um, I'm very cautious about when I do that. Uh, and so far, so good. But I'm just telling you, that's the law and how it works. All right, enough of that. So let me see here. Uh, oh, okay. Okay, so uh, the 4506-T, I don't know, you might, you'll should find it on the internet. I don't know if there's an online version of it. I don't know if you can ask by online. I think you have to do it in the mail. I've always done it in the mail. I can look for you, but um, yeah. Um, answer on HELOC. So answer about calling the mortgage, also applying to HELOCs. I've never seen that. The thing is on a HELOC, it's a second position. And I believe the business practice of a HELOC lender is to just basically shut up and take it. Meaning if there's a foreclosure, for example, or um, the HELOC, if you're not paying on the HELOC, most of the time from what I've seen, in some with a few exceptions, but the HELOC may have the right to foreclose. The problem is, if you're not paying on the mortgage and the HELOC forecloses, it's going to be foreclosed upon by the first lien holder. So for a HELOC, you're probably never going to be anywhere near having that situation when you convey the title. If anyone's going to give you a problem of it, it's going to be the, the first lien holder, your mortgage lender. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so the software provided by the by the exchanges is never going to have an OMB number on it. It's never never going to be um, a form approved by the Office of Management and Budget. It's going to be a Coinbase form. That's why I wanted to tell you, that's how you know. So that way, if something happens that we don't cover in this call, and, and I didn't say specifically about that, the way that you can check is two ways. You check for an OMB number, top right corner, and you check for your transcripts with the IRS. Um, just so you know, the exchanges are required by law to send you 1099s by email. They cannot send them to you in the mail, so don't look in the mail. And if, if it's email, chances are they may have an inbox type feature with the account that you can go check and download things. All right. And someone's saying, I'm finding a holding a company for my cryptos. I'm moving to Florida, but interested in New Mexico as they don't have income tax yet. Do you have best practice in using registered agent? Okay. so. I would name myself as agent. So if I set up a, a Florida company for something, let's say I want to run a business here, I would make myself the agent. Why would I do that? Well, all that means is I'm the guy that would get a summons if my company gets sued. Why should I pay somebody $150 a year when the chance of me getting sued is nil? Okay. Why should I do that? I'm just being practical. I mean, if I have partners and they insist on it, I guess I'll do that. I mean, it is a good practice, but... For, for what we're doing, most of the time, we're just using holding companies and we're investing stuff. I name my client as the agent in the state he's registered in and what I, uh, the company's registered in. And then I also go and find a valid business address that I can name as the agent's address. And that way my client doesn't have to pay money every year. Now, every once in a while, if, if the client you know wants to do it that way, fine. Or if it's a, a an operating business, I will recommend a registered agent. So that's how I do it. I almost never use a paid agent for, for what I do. Owner property IRA is a better holding the title in the LLC for lean on. Okay. Yeah, if you if you have clear title to real estate, first of all, I be, I believe your first risk is probably that you have clear title to real estate. So you might, may want to put some debt on there. All right. Get some get get some loan money on there. Um but yeah, you can deed it over to an LLC. Um, just know that if there are any liens on the property, uh, they'll they'll follow the ownership, so they'll still attach 
at that time. Um, if, if you do that and it, it's clean and clear, there's nothing there and you, you convey it over to the LLC, then there's no need to strip the equity with a lien. But if you're paranoid sometimes, I mean, I've done that before, um, you can also put a lien, but it's like double measure. It's redundant. Um, some people uh, may do that. I don't know if there's a real need to do that all the time. Um, but yeah, let's see. And let me see here, what's this? Bank for closing, yeah. I mean, here's the thing. We could have avoided that. All we had to do is, was do what they told us, okay? The bank said, convey the property back to the way you had it. And, and so my partner and I were actually laughing because that was a, it, was a, it was a fun deal, okay? The reason why we got into that is I met this guy at a United Way thing. We were, we were cleaning up after the hurricanes in North Florida. And, uh, and so we started talking one day and I said, hey, um, it sounds like you'd like to invest in real estate. Would you like to do a deal? And he's like, yeah, sure. So we went, we set up a company and we bought this duplex and uh, it was such a blast because we had, we rented it out to this tenant who was a business and all, it was a roof repair crew. So back in, in this area in Florida, they're fixing roofs all over the place because of the hurricanes. And so these guys, they, they're a bunch of uh, roofers and, and there was like 12 people living in a, in this duplex we had and they were paying us way too much for the rent and they didn't care because they're making tons of money and they trashed the place, but they cleaned it up when they were done. It was just, it was just a fun time. And, and so we just had such a good time. And so what was happening is the bank was saying, we're going to foreclose if you don't fix it. And, and my partner and I were like, whatever, send them the check. And so they would send the mortgage payment in and they would send it back and they would say, we can't process it. And so my partner called me up and he's like, John, what do we do? I said, well, take that check and put it in an envelope. And next month when the, re when the mortgage is due, do it again. And then every time they send the check back, just document that you sent them the check. That way, when they foreclose, we will not only have the use of all that money, which we made like thousands of dollars. It was like a debt-free property for years, for like three or four years, debt-free property. And uh, and when we go to the court, we'll just show the judge how they acted in bad faith and those sort of thing, which we did. And the court let them have it. And I didn't know at the time that this is it was inevitable anyways, that's another story. But, but anyways, so it was my partners and I decision to let them foreclose when we could have avoided it. So, you know, call that stupid if you want, but our, our thing was we just enjoy that experience and we made a bunch of cash off of it and we, don't, we didn't care what happened. So I'm not saying you should try this at home. All right. So um, yeah, all right, so let's see here. So asked about, um, about using our crypto LLC as a family member's IRA beneficiary in order to do that. I would not mix my IRA with a crypto portfolio that's not within an IRA. So if you're asking me about that, um, yeah. Using our crypto LLC as a family member's IRA beneficiary. That's a no-no. Like, no. yeah. yeah, to be the recipient of the, if something happened. Oh, right? okay. The beneficiary, I remember that now. I was yeah, saying- Yeah, because you were like, okay. what? That should be okay. That should be okay. As beneficiary, I'm very cautious on this. You never want to mix them, but okay. Yeah. You need a beneficiary. It's of no consequence to the trust terms. You're good. I think you're fine there. No problem. Yeah. Okay. No one's ever asked me that. So that's why I was wanting to be sure. Yeah. Well, that's why I wanted to bring it back up because I was like, maybe Thanks. you've had a few months to think on that and come up with some other reason why yeah, I, it wouldn't be a yeah. good idea. Yeah, I did. I remember. I know I didn't do more research, but I gave it some more thought and everything that I know, I just confirmed. Okay. I know that there's nothing else there. So because beneficiary, you can name your dog as beneficiary. Right. Well, I mean, did you know? Do you guys know you can do that? <laughs> well, but how? No, because then how? How do? They, what do they do with the ten ninety nine? You've got to give them some sort of EIN number. Oh, they'll take care of that. <laughs> your, do <laughs> your dog can have a tax number, and your dog can have a guardian ad litem. What? Your dog can go through probate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, but yeah. So when you when you say beneficiary, it's perfect because. It's, it's not a person that is involved in the IRA to the extent that it's custodian and has a tax liability of any kind. It could be a child, so. Yeah, I mean, they'll have a tax liability once the person dies, right? And you're the beneficiary, then you have to take the required minimum that distributions, et cetera. Right. And so then you'll get the 1099 or whatever. But at that, that point, change. it just acts like any other mm -hmm. 1099 you'll you would receive, fine. right? Yep, you'll be fine for what you wanna do right now. Okay, yep. thank you. All right, <laughs> what, what address to use in the state? Okay, so. The way I do a registered agent is, so if you don't want to hire somebody, all I do is I go on the internet and I look for um, office space for lease. 
in the city I want to be in or the state. And I find lots of office space for lease. And I pick one. I pick one that's for lease. I'm not going to lease it. I'm just going to use that address. They don't care. They get, ad they get mail there all the time anyways. And uh, the only mail that would go to that address that I choose is going to be solicitations for some sort of service, business, stuff like that, right? Junk mail, as you call it. So uh, that's what I do. Um, sometimes my clients don't like that, like 1% of the time. They just say, oh, I want a registered agent. Okay, fine. I can get you one. A lot of times I can get you an agent. There's an agent out there right now. I don't I don't remember the name, um, but it does a free service, free registered agent service for the first year. And I think it charges $99 a year after that if you guys want to have an agent. There was some attorney at Wyoming Secretary of State that was just like hounding me, me, about all the companies I'm registering in Wyoming. And she would audit everything I filed. And so just to avoid the, the um, drama with my client, I didn't want my client to have to deal with this. I just went, uh, I always get them the free agent for the first year, you know, and then let them know what the, what's going on there. But uh, any other, I don't think she's doing that anymore. I think she went, she got promoted or something. I don't know, but, but that's what, that's what I would do. Um, yeah. So let's see what situations would a trust need to be in an LLC. Okay. Um, you can have a trust own an LLC. The reason you might do that is so that you have an innocent party that owns a company, whereas the only other choice might be yourself. So let's say you might you might have a high risk. Maybe you might have a risk of being sued or or you, or you want some measure of privacy. So you want to separate the tr the ownership of the LLC from your estate. So if John Smith has no choice but to be John Smith as the owner of the LLC, well then John Smith can be the trustee of the owner. And then that way, that just that change right there would separate his personal interest and liability from the company. It makes it a third party arm's length transaction. So what situations would a trust need to be in an LLC? I don't know that a trust is in the LLC. You would have an LLC that's owned by a trust or an association, an unincorporated. It could be a group of people. It could be two members or more. Uh, and, and the reason why I would do that is to separate my client's property rights in the company that he cares about from his personal estate. Now, I almost always do that. I almost always do that just in case that, you know, three years from now, something happens that you never anticipated and you can't find me and you don't know what to do. If you just rely on the documents I gave you and the learning that you have from that, you'll be fine. That, that's why I do it as a practice. Uh, for the LLC I just set up, can I have two separate bank accounts? Yeah, one for the personal and one for, yeah, you can do that. Okay, so if you set up an LLC and you wanna, you wanna use it for two purposes. Let's say one purpose is for a business and one is for a personal. So you can open two different bank accounts and you decide which one is gonna be all business stuff and all personal. And it's under the same umbrella and that's what it's designed for. An LLC is designed to handle and uh, handle all kinds of income from different sources and it even, gets around the issue of co-mingling, okay? This is not co-mingling. Co-mingling has to do with mixing different types of income when there's when you're entitled to some sort of benefit of some kind, like a statutory benefit, and then you do something you're not supposed to, like mixing revenue, that is co-mingling. And then you, you defeat, a, you defeat a, um, a benefit that you're given by the government, okay? And what we're talking about is housekeeping. So if I wanna mix personal and business, or I wanna separate it with the same company, I can certainly do that and I can have two balance sheets. I can have one for the personal and one for business, two different bank accounts, two different statements, two different balance sheets, same LLC. No problem, I've done those once in a while, no big deal. Um, inevitable foreclosure, okay. I'll just say real quick, I handled over a thousand foreclosures during the crisis. Just to, I took on a bunch of those cases to just to see what was going on. I probably did about 35 different states worth of foreclosures and it, here's why it's inevitable. Um, the foreclosure incident, the foreclosure mortgage-backed securities, all that stuff you heard about in the news in the, in the 2000s, <clears throat> that came out of the late 80s, okay? <clears throat> Wall Street set this up so they can pillage foreign pension funds, including our own, but foreign pension funds. So they created free money for people that shouldn't have had mortgages, that got mortgages <clears throat> in the 80s and 90s. It came into the 2000s. It took 20 years to develop this, 25 years to develop this. And then Wall Street then went and made deals with other countries 
to be allowed to go into those countries and sell mortgage-backed securities to the fund managers for all the pension funds of these foreign countries in Europe and probably South America and probably Asia too. In, and the Americans, right? North America, it's Canada, we're not, we're not immune to this stuff. So the fund managers had no choice but to buy into these mortgage-backed securities because that was pretty much the only thing making money on the stock market. And they, it was engineered that way, I should say. So the mortgage system itself was engineered to fail or to suffer what you guys saw. And so it's, this is why I say it was inevitable. The foreclosure was inevitable. When they started foreclosure, it's inevitable. Unless, like the only exception to that would be where, I, now, this, this sounds crazy, but Bank of America did foreclose on people's homes that had no mortgage. So I don't wanna get in too far on that, but the way I believe that those pension funds were able to be stolen from the Wall Street investors through mortgage-backed securities is that these foreign countries told Wall Street, we'll let you come in here and do that, but you're going to guarantee that you can foreclose on these properties and you can exhaust those lien rights and you can make sure that our interests are insured and that you can make this work. So what that means is they had to make sure that the court system would foreclose on everything that the banks wanted. And I could tell you right now, I had cases where we caught them in open court with flat out forgery and fraud. I mean, every case was forgery. Everyone was, but we actually caught them like the words coming out of their mouth admitted that it was forgery. Okay. And they, this one case I had, they literally ran out of the courtroom. I'm not making this up. And they had to go, they ran out, and next thing you know, a month later, they redid a bunch of documents, filed it in the court, and excused themselves, and the judge went along with it and gave the house to the bank. So that's why I say it that way. Long story, sorry. And then as beneficiary, yeah, Jen, beneficiary. All right. Um, any issues using LLC, EIN for Ameritrade account? No, it's a good idea. Use an LLC. It's going to have its own EIN. And that is how you separate out that liability from you yourself personally. Okay. And then let's see, use LLC to docs to establish an account. I'm, I got a, uh, I got to open this up a little bit so I can see. Um, yeah. Okay. So sometimes you have trouble with opening accounts. So LLC to open an account with Nexo. Um, simply said they don't allow PMAs. That happens. So I give you a couple options in your README first file if you guys want to. If you really want that service. It's none of their damn business to tell you this, but if you want the account, you kind of have to go along with it. I don't know that you have a cause of action for companies that want to do this, okay? They can't tell you how to manage risk. So what you can do is make yourself a single member owner, or you can amend the articles, or you can just tell them that you amended the articles, or you can just tell them that you're the trustee of the PMA, or you can say you're the only member of the PMA, okay? and leave your articles the same. You can also start out with a single member or a double member. You can add your mom on there, right? Put your mom on there if you want, if you want charging order. And then you can open your account at Nexo. The other person's gonna have to give his ID, okay, as part of KYC. Once that's all said and done, you can amend the articles if you really like the PMA idea. So you gotta, you gotta work around a little bit, yeah. But, but before I would change anything, I would just tell them that you are the PMA. Tell them whatever you have to to open the account, all right? Yeah, I tried that. They're like flat out. I've done four emails with them. They're like, no PMAs, period. And I was like, okay, okay. look, what if I have, just revise it and I'll be the single member because ultimately it's the same beneficial interest. And they're like, well, then you have to get it revised, which I mean- Yeah, yeah, that's, so. that's unusual. So, so yeah, they're gonna look at your articles. So you have to amend the articles in that case if you wanna deal with them. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I if just you want submit the, it, it's not like, and then who cares, right? I mean, I have the real articles, so it doesn't matter. Well, once you, okay, once you amend the articles and you show them and they're all happy and they open the account, amend the articles again and put it the way you want. <laughs> you know, um, another way to do it is you have a- well, I don't a, even think I have to amend the articles. I think they just oh. want to see the operating agreement different. Well, okay. Then take your bank abstract documents right, and modify those and give it to them and don't amend the articles. Yeah. That's even better. Great. Okay. And then, that way, yeah, yeah, I did have to amend the articles for one thing, but then I just amended them back. So it was like, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, if I have to, I will, if they tell me 
like I thought it sounded like they told you that. But yeah, I'll just amend documents. I'll tell them whatever I have to to open the account because the articles establish the rights and liabilities, not what I tell them. They okay. can't act on what I tell them. So. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry I had that situation, but that's how these guys are. They just think that they yeah. own you. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so office address to open a bank account online out of the state. Yeah, you can use whitepages.com. Now, whitepages.com to get an address for your company. I used to do that a long time ago. Um, I, I was using residential addresses. Now I just think it's a little better practice to use business addresses. They're better suited to take mail that's not for them. You know. Um, all right, and then get around Gemini's asking for this over and over. What, what are they asking for? We're looking for a document that has been filed with the state. Yeah, you have to give that to them. They want to see a copy of the articles that were filed with the state. It'll have a date stamp on there and a seal of the state. And they're nice enough to accept the unofficial copy now. And we, we, if I registered, I usually give you a copy of it. If I haven't, you can either you can pull it down from the Secretary of State's office. And you would think, why don't they do that? But they don't. So you can go to the, the Secretary of State's office online and search on your company, and then it'll show up. And then you download the articles. Sometimes it's not that easy. But let me know if you need help with that. But they do need to see the articles um, that's been filed with the state. All right. Set up a trading account with Jay's Trust. Yeah, a Jay's Trust, I know he has accounts like that. He Jay uses the trust just like I use LLCs. That's just his style. Mine's LLCs. I have a different history and understanding of, of why I do that. And I've explained that before. But that's fine. You could do it that way. All right. I, I'm sorry if I missed some of you guys that were had your hand up. I'm gonna I gotta move the, my window back over here. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. There is uh there's Rich. Go ahead, Rich. Yes, John. Is it safe to assume if we have not received a 1099 from an exchange that they haven't reported anything to the IRS? Yes, that's correct. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. So um Anything, if you guys want, if I'm, you know, if there's some, some stuff in the news that you want me to cover or research on our next call, please let me know. I will certainly do that. Otherwise, um, you know, I, I try to talk about topics that I find are popular during the week when I talk to people. So um, we could do it that way. But all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up. Uh, appreciate everyone's participation. Y'all have a good night. Enjoy your weekend. Oh, wait a minute, Demetra has, has to ask one thing. Go ahead, Demetra. Yeah, I wanted to ask you um, for future, when you and I last spoke, you talked about, remember I told you my, my feeling, I'm souring on the cryptos and you said there's so many good opportunities. Would you be open to doing a video, just giving us some ideas of how we can broaden our investment horizons? The real world outside of the crypto land? Yes, sir. <laughs> That'd be fine. Okay. I'll make some notes on that. Um, good plan. Like that idea. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank Dimitri. you. All, All right. right. Thanks, John. Y'all good night. Bye-bye. You too.